and we're live. What's up, everybody? Oh shit! And we're live. What's up, everybody? Yo, welcome to the in your face show. And I'm with my main man. He's been on the show before. My main man, Andre Owens. Hey, take it away. What's up? What's up? What's up, man? How you doing today? I'm doing good, brother. Doing good, man. It's, man. No, I'm glad it's another another good day to be alive. You know, keeping everything. Hell happy. yeah, you know, hell yeah. That's all you can do, man. Make someone smile. You know what I mean? Make someone smile on your day, and you're doing a good job. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Yeah. So how's your man? No, go ahead. How's your uh? How's your day going? Day's going good, man. You know, I'm here just here. Uh, I'm uh, just chilling. I was writing a little earlier on a couple of different projects. You know, got a. A lot of stuff in the lab trying to make things happen, you know, got Kickstarter going, you know, uh, writing scripts, uh, writing comic book scripts, uh, you know, always trying to get, you know, trying to stay creative, man, you know, as much as I can. I'm, I'll tell you what I've been wasting time with is, I don't know if you've seen it, but that uh, new thing called Mid Journey, the, uh, mm. a, the AI the AI design artwork, I've been wasting hours on that shit. Now. I've been just, you know, just doing all <laughs> kinds of stuff. I mean, it changes everything, man. You know, it's like, you know, no, you no longer have to go, you know, scour the internet for images for like, you know, like lookbooks for like Hollywood and stuff, you know, now, and, you know, someone that's not an artist like me, it allows me now to just, you know, it, write my vision down and pop the artwork out, you know? I mean, it's not perfect yet, but it's it's really, it's a really great tool now for all of us who are, you know, creators who don't have the, the artistic skills. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's, that is true, man. Uh, yeah, so. A lot of the stuff that, that a lot of the stuff that I see today nowadays, man, is it's what to be working with, man. It's a lot of shit that's good, man. A lot of yeah, shit. Yeah, no, no, man. I mean, that, you know, that's the thing about the internet that's amazing to me is like, you know, there's so much talent out there. You know what I mean? And you mm -hmm. see it all the time. You know, it's like it's it's it's, it's so encouraging. You know, like I know some people will get, you know, get like get, I guess get jealous or envious of people's skills, but you know, I'm just the opposite, man. I see like somebody doing something and I'm just blown away by it. You know, I'm excited for mm -hmm. it. It's like you know, like. When you were doing Jarhead and you brought me on to you know do a little writing, I was excited to do it. You know, it's like, man, this is cool. You know, this is something that's fun. It isn't, you know, it should, you know, look, man, I'm I'm writing comics and movies. You know, it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a stressful thing. You know, it should be it should be fun. You know, it should, it should be exciting. Right. I mean, it is stressful because ain't no money, but you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, in real life, it's 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 really not. It's you know, it's a stress reliever for me at least. Well, to me, is to be honest with you, it's 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 a God-given thing, man. It's it's something that I, to be honest with you, you know what I'm saying. It's something that I reach the people with, you know what I'm saying. Right. It's something that I, uh, I go for. Well, you, yeah. You know, I think you learn over your life is what your strengths are. You know what I mean, and what mm -hmm. you're good at, and where and where you can really make the most impact with those strengths. You know, you know when you're right. young, you really don't. Under, I mean, you know, no knock on young people at all because you know, obviously I was young and I thought I knew what I, I knew what I meant. But, you know, with age comes a bit of wisdom and you can actually see, you know, like, oh, oh, I can make a difference if I do this, you know. So, right, it, it's, right. you know, hey, man, life's, life's a, you know, a, a exciting long journey, you know what I mean? So you got to make the best of it. Right, man. Like uh, a lot of the stuff that that a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with in. Hold up. Let me go to Samuel Lewis. He said, nice. What's up, bro? Samuel. What's up, bro? What's, What's goody with you, bro? Oh man! But anyways, as I was saying, let's get then. Let's get into the to the uh 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 to your comic, my man. All right, man. yeah. All right, man. So Hollywood, look, Hollywood uh, offenders, yeah. And now Hollywood offenders. So Go ahead, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> go, ahead, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, No, no, I was just going to say Hollywood Offenders, man. It's, you know, it's my newest thing. Um, I know, I know people are always interested in, like, you know, we, you know, we understand Hollywood, but what's this Offenders thing? You know, it's not Offenders or Avengers or Defenders. And what it comes from is when I was a kid, like, most, you know, most, of, you know, like, you probably did it, and like, everybody else probably did it. When I was a kid, I wrote my own stories and, you know, made comics and stuff. And then when I was a little kid, instead of doing the Avengers or the Defenders, I came up with the Afenders, A F E N D R E S. So it was just my old comic books we always had. So when I came up, when we came up with this Hollywood um, Offenders idea, we decided to name it after that. You know, so that's where the name came from. Um, the the story is created by me and my writing partner David Lyle Johnson, who uh, is a talented writer and everything. I wish he could come to the show, but he's very shy about doing, you know, like media and stuff. So I ended up doing all this stuff. But um, yeah, Hollywood Offenders came out of the, uh, our fever pitch. We were living together during the pandemic. 
So, you know, we were writing all kinds of stuff. We were both writers, so we were working on stuff together. And this is the one project that came to fruition, you know, out of all that. Okay, okay, okay. So where do you feel that the offenders, the Hollywood offenders, right? Yeah. Where would you put the Hollywood offenders? Which genre would you put it? Okay, well, okay, so I'll tell you, I'll give you a little background about it, and you can maybe they can make this. So it's a, it's a comedy, and it's, um, a, I wouldn't say a farce, but a, not a farce, but like an homage to uh, to Hollywood itself. You know, it's like uh, the Hollywood Defenders is like a love letter to Hollywood in the same way that uh, that musical La La Land was a love letter to L.A. You know, it's something that, you know, David lived in Hollywood. I lived in L.A. for 25 years. You know, I got to know the area or whatever, and we just came up with this idea. So the, the basic idea of the Hollywood Defenders is that uh, it takes place in a, you know, kind of an altered, skewed universe where um, Hollywood Boulevard has been divided into seven kingdoms, like a Game of Thrones situation. So they have like the costume impersonators, you know, the guys, that, the buskers, the guys that wear the, you know, dresses, you know, costume people, you know, versus the uh, the mixtape guys. You know, you always go, you always see those mixtape guys trying to give you the mixtapes. And we got mm -hmm. against them. We got the uh, we got the the um, cosmetologists, which is our version of the Scientologists, when they're trying to give you a makeover audit. So we got all these different kingdoms on Hollywood Boulevard, including the parking lot attendants. And they're in this Game of Thrones situations where they're all battling for supremacy of the boulevard. And out of that comes five costumed impersonators uh, who have to band together to fight this new nem nemesis that's coming to the boulevard, um, uh, Johnny Tommy, who is a, uh, a childhood uh, a child star for 130 years. He's been perpetually 12 years old. And he's trying to, uh, he, he, he was born of celluloid. So he's the evil ver villain in our story. Right, right, right. True that, true that, true that. So, okay, tell us about the villain. What's the villain like? What's the okay? What is so, he? So, 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 so Tommy John. So, so Johnny Tommy is his name, and 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 supposedly he was born of the first celluloid from. So Edison was doing his kinescope back in the nineteenth century, like eighteen eighty eight, eighteen ninety, and uh, supposedly Johnny Tommy, when he saw the first register of film, Johnny Tommy was born out of it as a full human being, a full twelve year old boy. And he started taking on his, as a kid, he, he, he was in all, all these movies. So, you know, he took on this persona called Lil Colt. And you know, Lil Colt is this, you know, this little kid that's this bad, this little badass little kid. But he's been in like hundreds of movies supposedly over the years. So, you know, they had movies like Lil Colt versus the FBI, you know, Lil Colt meets Frankenstein, you know, Lil Colt versus Dracula. There's just all these supposedly Lil Colt movies. So over the years, Lil Colt got really big and, you know, powerful and famous, but he's been perpetually 12 years old. So he's in always these, these kids' movies. Or you know, playing childhood stars, um, but in our universe, uh, with the with celluloid disappearing, you know, film disappearing and, and digital taking over as the technology, uh, Lil Colt's losing his power because he gets his power from being in celluloid film. So Lil Colt, our villain, his plan is to uh, crowdfund a movie that he wants to make and shoot it on 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 film so he can regain his his power through celluloid. And uh, he decide he's gonna uh, he's gonna crowdfund his movie by. Um, robbing people on Hollywood Boulevard. He's got his all his sidekick and minions will be robbing people on Hollywood Boulevard. And that's the that's the story that our five offenders have to come together to stop. Mm. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a crazy story, man. It's like, you know, it's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a far you know wild fantasy farce, you know, um like I said, an homage to Hollywood and everything about it. We, you know, we have all kind of you know Easter eggs in there about different things in Hollywood. I mean, some stuff inside baseball that some people get, but uh, you know, for the general audience though, it's still very, very um, open and excessive, you know, um, uh, to them because we introduce all these different characters. You know, we, we have the five offenders. So we have uh, we have um, Deborah Ann Choi. Now she's a, uh, a Korean American girl from Mississippi. Who's just moved to LA to make her to make her to make her way, and she's working at a, a store on on Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, she realizes that she can make more money as a costume uh, impersonator. So she uh, gets her parents uh, the, her parents out of a chicken restaurant in Mississippi. So she takes the the costume, the chicken costume, and you know goes to Hollywood Boulevard to make money as a chicken, but no one knows who she is. So you got her. We've got Philadelphia Dell Thursday, this uh, a Latino guy from um, Bakersfield who's an Uber driver. Who like uh, disguises himself as this character Ma Major Universe to uh, you know work on Hollywood Boulevard? So we got them. Then we've got this Michael Jackson guy who just it's always Michael Jackson, even though he he doesn't he tries to be different things like he tries to be a vampire, but he's still Michael Jackson because he's got the hat, he's got you know everything looks like him, but he's still got vampire teeth. And he's always like, well, you know, why don't I, why is everything a Michael Jackson? I'm a vampire. So we got him. Then we got Janelle Mason, 
who um, is the mother of the of the Boulevard. She's been there supposedly like 40 years impersonating Madonna. She's a black woman, but she impersonates Madonna. So she uh, she you know she knows everyone. So she gets all the intel and everything about the Boulevard. And the last member of the Hollywood Offenders is Norma is Norma Jean, and she's supposedly the love child of JFK and Marilyn Monroe's love child. So and so she's uh, owns a, you know property on Hollywood Boulevard. She's the money behind the whole group. So that's the that's the Hollywood offenders who get together to uh, take on this you know this guy Lil Cole and his plans to uh, control Hollywood Boulevard. Awesome, shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's a, it's yeah, it's a it's a it's a crazy story, but I think you know I think it's gonna really work. I think uh I think it'll um you know really hit people in a good place. Okay, okay, so okay. Tell us about the Michael Jackson type of character. So, what okay, so he's all about? Okay, so the Michael Jackson's a guy. He's been on the boulevard for a long time. He's been impersonating Michael Jackson for so long, he can't do anything else. Like, he tries to, like, um, you know, because people start giving him a hard time. They're like, oh, Michael Jackson, you know, children, my child molesters. Like, but, you know, be like, but I'm not Michael Jackson. I'm, you know, uh, Elvis. And it'll just be look like, it'll look like Michael Jackson, but have the Elvis shirt, you know, shirt on or something. But he can't change who he is because he's been Michael Jackson for so long. He just can't do it. Now, the cool thing in our in our story, the Michael Jackson character is our ultimate fighter. So he can he's uh, he can kick people's asses by using uh, all these Michael Jackson dance moves to uh, you know to beat people up. So he, he's our he's our warrior in our group. He's the one that does all the physical combat. So that's uh, that's you know he's done like I said he's been on the Boulevard a long time. Been playing Michael Jackson for a long time and can't do anything else but be Michael Jackson and then as a vampire or as an alien. Like at one point he puts an alien ha- head on. You know, from like the movie Alien, but he still got the Michael Jackson outfit because that's just who he is. Oh, uh, okay, okay, yeah. awesome, cool. So basically, yes. like um, the likeness of Michael Jackson, although right, you yeah. know, yeah, exactly. You know, you know it's it's like a, I don't know if you saw there was a video that went viral recently from uh, from Vegas. Uh, speaking of Vegas Raiders, um, there was a video went viral <laughs> from Vegas with a. Uh, with uh, this Michael Jackson impersonator kicking this guy's ass, and I was like, "Oh shit!" So we we posted on social media, you know, under our Hollywood offenders tag, you know, because <laughs> it's like that's that's our Michael Jackson right there, the guy that beats people's asses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, okay, tell tell the people what Hollywood is, what has what Hollywood has to do with your story. Okay, so well, our story can only take place in Hollywood because the whole thing is about you know the film industry and um, you know um, okay, um, and, okay. And film history and that kind of thing. So you know it, it has to take place somewhere like that. And Hollywood Boulevard knows. Um, I don't know if you've been to L.A., but you know it's uh, it's not an important part of L.A. because L.A. is gigantic, but it's an important part of Hollywood. You know, a lot of big tourist area, so it's you know very memorable for people who visit. So. Um, that's what we're touching on, you know. We're we're touching on the locals that'll know things. You'll be like, oh, you know, that's happening on you know, Hollywood and Vine, and I know what happened there or whatever. You know, there's a Popeyes on that corner or whatever. But you know, for like someone like that, you know, from Kansas that doesn't do it, they'll be introduced to a whole new universe. You know, of the this Hollywood, this mythical Hollywood Boulevard. You know, it's like a it's like a Game of Thrones kind of situation. You know, there's just different different houses controlling stuff. Okay, okay, okay. So, so what? How many, How long have you been running your Kickstarter for Hollywood? So Kickstarter is relatively new, man. We're uh, we're uh, we got 22 days to go, so we've been going on for about eight days. We're about a third of the way, um, uh, you know, um, pledge wise, got our pledge, our goal. We're about a third of the way toward our goal. Um, um, uh, you know, so we're really hoping that we can, you know, we're really hoping that we can get to it right now. So we've had about 22 days to go to raise about six thousand dollars. So. You know, if y'all are out there, please, please, please pledge. I'm sure he put the, you know, the link down in the description somewhere. Um, you know, help, help us out. We're trying to get this thing done. I think, I really think it'll be an exciting book. It'll be an awesome book. You know, it'd be yeah. an awesome book. Um, yeah, the money's going I to really... pay for our artist. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, so yeah, the money's just going to pay for our artist, Alan St. Clark, who's a terrific artist. He was in Oakland. I think he's out of Portland now. Um, you know, young brother who's just talented as, as I don't know what. And no, and, and gets our idea perfectly so you know it's uh, for those of you out there wondering about the artwork it's it's going to be fantastic okay okay all right awesome 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 you know i've been thinking too about uh pledging with some of these kickstarters right, right but yeah. i don't even know what um 
with Kickstarter really. I don't even know really too much about Kickstarter really. Oh, okay, you know well, well, Kickstarter is a crowdfunding site, you know, where people like me or you know, creator or creators of all kinds of things, not just comic books. You know, you can kickstart anything. You know, a play, a film, a, a record, a, a you know, a new a new uh, device, a new, a new a new spoon or something. You know, whatever you want to kickstart, you can do that to raise fund, you know, raise funding for it. So it's a way for someone like me to raise funding to pay for um, artwork, and at the same time, it builds an audience towards you know. For your for your product or whatever you have, so you know you get a hundred, you know two hundred, three hundred, four hundred. I mean, some people get thousands of supporters and make you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on the on the can on the uh, on the site, you know, to kickstart their project. You know, that's that's what it means, you know, kickstarting their project. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely a crowdfunding site, and I you know I encourage everyone to go there and look. And there's so much stuff there that you know though you don't have to just choose my project. You know, I wish you would. I hope please 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 support our project. Um, <laughs> But, uh, uh, but uh, you know, there's tough kind of stuff up there. You know, you can find all kind of good shit up there. So. Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. So what are the other titles that you've done in the industry? Oh, okay. So, I mean, for the comic book industry, I've had a huge, you know, uh, I've got nine different books that I'm working on. This will be the 10th book. And I've been uh, doing this graphic novel called Omega Chronicles for the uh, last 20 some years I've been working on it. It was originally uh, uh, serialized in my um, anthology book, Force Galaxia. There's three issues of that, but I pulled the story out of it after issue two and it, it was originally supposed to be a graphic novel. And, uh, but I changed back in the early 2000s. I decided to release it as a, in this anthology. But uh, I've been working on this thing for like 20 years, it's 230 pages long. Um, I'm gonna do a Kickstarter for that after this. It's not gonna be a big one, just enough to, uh, I paid my letter because um, all the other all the artwork's done. It's a long term project. So my books I have are Force Galaxia, which is a sci fi superhero anthology with you know different stories in it. Um, about my my main character of uh, Super Green fourteen. He um him and his gang when they're teenagers on on future Earth. Uh, that's you know main story and the Sisters of Power in there also. So we have Force Galaxia. I have issues one, two, and three of that. We have uh, the Stone Age, which is an autobiographical book about when I used to work at a bong store on Melrose back in the late 90s, you know, so all kind of crazy shit would go on. It was about my first day at work there and all kind of crazy shit that went down there. And that's really cool. So I have that, we have um, the Bovine League, which is one of my favorite things to write. Um, you know, it's about genetically altered superpowered cows. And, uh, you know, this is all set in my future universe uh, of, you know, of, my, of Hero Unlimited universe. So so the genetically altered superpowered cows from Switzerland, and uh, they, uh, they have to go on a quest around the globe to find the stolen cosmic udder in the four teats of matter. So that's really a fun book to write because that's like my straight up both superhero book where I just, you know, can do all kind of superhero tropes and, you know, play with that stuff, introduce all kind of cool villains and have all kind of great fight scenes, you know, so that's what that is. I've got another book, um, Sisters of Power, which, is, which comes out of Force Galaxia that I wrote with a guy named John Crosby. He's a very talented writer out of uh, New England. Um, uh, Massachusetts in particular. Um, he's a you know, good guy. And I wrote the first issue with him. Um, issue two has been taken over. John's still writing, but we've uh, got a woman by the name of Isis Climes to uh, to come on um, mm -hmm. as a writer. So we got Sisters of Power, uh, and then then we have this thing called Hero Unlimited One Shot, where I bring like new writers or new artists together to do like um, individual stories in my in my universe. So that's all the different books I got going right now. But you know, it's, like I said, it, we're working on tons of stuff. You know, s second and third issues of books, uh, fourth and fifth issues. You know. Always got something in the lab and trying to, you know, something in the factory to put forward. And as long as you get these Kickstarters going or I can you know, get the funding, this will they'll all go, all be done. Okay, okay. Because, you know, I want to touch on something, you know. Um, yeah. Apart from what we're, what we're talking about, I want to talk to talk about the conventions, you know. Okay. Yo, the conventions. How are the conventions when it comes to um first time creators like when it comes to the first time being at a convention well i i think one of the the hardest thing for first time creators is the gal the, the gauge what kind of audience you're going to have you know what i mean i know what for me with the first time i did a convention i only had one book and i took and i and i printed way too many copies of this was back in the day when you when print on demand wasn't uh, wasn't there yet so you had to do offset printing so you know you had to get Two or three thousand copies of your book printed just to you know to make it cheap enough to have. So I got way too many copies of my book printed. 
and was um, way overestimating how much I was going to make at a convention, you know, originally. Uh, now, over the years, I've refined how I do my, my you know, my, my, because I've been doing it for 20 years, you know, so I've figured out, you know, the best way to sell books and what sells best and how to promote and how to do that. So, you know, you learn lessons. But one of the biggest lessons I think is people, you, you overestimate how much you're actually going to make at your first convention. You know, now, you know, obviously there are, there are exceptions to the rule. You know, I know people made, you know, sold out of every one of their books at their first convention because they've they built an audience beforehand. I mean, that's like the Kickstarter thing. You know, this whole indie comics game is about building an audience that will follow you, you know, that you can that will support you. You know, no more than no different than Marvel and DC. You know, we have Marvel fanboys and DC fanboys. You know, you get fanboys of my company, of Hero Unlimited. You know, you get you know, you want to get you want to build that audience. You know, you want that those people to follow you from store to store, story to story. Okay, yeah, do that, do that, do that. Yeah, because I, 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 I've been hearing a lot of stories, a lot of stories on um, how the conventions are so overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, well, you know, they, I mean, the large conventions really are overwhelming. I mean, there's, because, you know, you go to Comic-Con in San Diego, which I did for, you know, several years, we, um, we, 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 um, we uh, displayed down there, you know, we vended down there. And the thing about comic, it's great. I mean, you know, Comic Con's fantastic. I, I can't, you know, I love going to comic. It's like going to Mecca is for a comic book person. You know, it's wonderful. And being able to sell your books at Comic Con is great. You know, the problem is Comic Con's so expensive. You know what I mean? And you have to make so much money just to get, get your money back. So after about five years of doing that, I didn't do Comic Con anymore. I only do I do a lot of smaller shows now, like a Black Comics Day, which is in February in San Diego, which is now a two day show. And it's fantastic, you know. It's um, it's uh, directed to the it's it's a black centered show, and you know we have you know it's uh, I I can't tell you good enough things about how great you know, black comics there is. And there's all kind of other conventions around the country. There's Act Back East Coast Black Age of Comics convention. You know, there's a um, um, MechaCon. You know, there's tons of other black conventions that go on. Uh, there's two conventions that go on the uh, on on Martin Luther King weekend, one in New York and one in San Francisco. So there's a lot of you know smaller black shows going that are really great to go to, and you sell really well because people are there to buy that type of things. And um, you know, so I I really enjoy going to. Now I do bigger shows too because obviously I don't want you know I just don't write comics just for black folks. You know, I write I write a comics I want to mel- I want to tell and I want a large audience to see them. And now some of my characters happen to be black, of course, because that's the story. That's my worldview. You know, so that's why mm-hmm. I would have those characters. But, you know, my audience, you know, I mean, hell, I've got a, I've got a comic about, you know, genetically ultra superpowered cows. So I have a good audience in Switzerland, you know, so, you know, it, it, it's it's fine. You know what I'm realizing, you know, what you realize about it is finding your niche and, and knowing your audience and how to, you know, um, fulfill them and while building a while building a larger audience, you know, you right, know so, right. because you, you want everybody to read your shit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, to. um. Because I, I, the comic convention scene, I've always hear heard a lot of stories because I've always asked, you know what I mean? Like, what is it like for um, for having like a, a top selling book? Is it as? I wish I knew, man. I've never had a top selling book, so. <laughs> you know, but I, I, like, I, I look at friends that do have top selling books, and the conventions are they're busy, man. I mean, you know. You get someone like um, Sebastian Jones with his Stranger, your Stranger Comics, you know, where they had their success with Niobe, and now it's a, you know, sold to HBO as a series. You know, they're in development for that. You know, you look at him, and that guy worked so hard, him and his crew, because they got so many people coming to their booth. And I'm sure it could be, you know, really exhausting. I mean, even for me, who, you know, gets a tenth of the kind of sales he gets, um, it's exhausting at a convention. You know, it's it's hard work. It's fun. It's, and I could do it all the time. I could do it every weekend, you know, if I, if, if I could just do it, if I had the money and, and if there were the conventions, I could do it. I'd love to do it every weekend, you know, as a thing, or every, you know, for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It would be great because it's fun. It's good to go out and sell your book. You know, you get to talk to people. You get to talk to fans. People are excited, you know. Um, so I, I really enjoy doing conventions. The problem is, you know, it's just, you know, financially, can you afford to pay for the convention? Can you afford to go to the city it's in or, you know, whatever? I mean, it's it's I think it's a little easier on the East Coast because there's so many different cities close together. You can drop you know, you can jump the you know the Boston, the Philadelphia, the Baltimore, you know, to Charlotte. You know what I mean? And it's not that bad. Yeah, out here what out here west, you know, it's a long distance between uh, L.A. and say Seattle. You know, you're gonna have to fly up there. You know, so it, it involves you know, logistics to get all your books and all your you know convention materials up. You gotta fly from New, uh, from California to Seattle. 
Oh yes, yeah, it's no, yeah, yeah. You got to realize, LA is like uh, think about LA. It's about like where Georgia is on the East Coast, and Seattle is about where Boston is. Oh you know shit! I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Like, yeah, the West Coast is gigantic. Yeah, no. Yeah, if you've never been to the West Coast, you know, you know, it's gigantic. I mean, and the thing about it is, you know, there's uh, you have to think of it this way. So there's there's at the top, there's there's Washington. There's three states on the West Coast. There's Washington, and Seattle's at the very top of Washington. Then there's Oregon, and Portland is the big city there. Then down, then below Oregon's California. And there's a whole part of California before you get to San Francisco, and then below San Francisco is L.A., and below that San Diego. So those are, those are major cities on the West Coast. So there's conventions at all those places. There's all kind of conventions at smaller cities throughout that area. You know, like um, like uh, like Sacramento Con or uh, you know things like at Rose City Con in Portland. So they're there, but the distance is so large, it's hard just to you know get a just to drive to them to bring like because I you know I bring a lot of stuff to conventions. I got a ta- I got a stand. You know, you got all this different stuff, and you know to fly with it, you have, it costs. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's easier to drive. So it'd be easy. I think it'd be easier on the on the East Coast to. Uh, do multiple conventions in a season. Right, right, right. Like, cause, man, like, I've always wondered to myself, you know what I'm saying? Because I've always asked a lot of questions when it comes to these things because, you know, you want to you wanna go to these places and right. well, these man, things, I mean, you, know, you know. To be honest with you, they're, they're the best things. You know what I mean? Like, these conventions are, are, the, are the best that you uh, can do for indie comics. Nah, uh uh-uh. But, yeah, I... I always wonder, like, because when it comes to, like, um, sorry about that, my mom was like, <laughs> in the room. But nah, um, when it came to um, conventions, I've always wondered about the, the overwhelmingness. Because the, I, I, I've always, t- I took it like this, you know, me as a person, put me in that position, you know. I believe I I flourish in that environment. Shit, right. you know what I'm saying? Because I could talk. Well, I, I can pull all kind of skin. I mean, you got to pull all kind of things to get people to your booth. You know what I mean? I mean, I used to sit there and yell out to people and be like, you know, I see somebody wear a red shirt walk by, I'd be like, you know, dudes in red shirts love Force Galaxia comics. You know, some shit like that. And people are like, what? <laughs> you talking about me? You know, and, you know. Where, now I picked that up. Now I'll tell you a quick story about that. Why I do weird stuff like that? I I once had a job. During the during the holiday season, as the voice of the holiday holiday bear house, so it's one of those you know at the you know the mall they had one of those fake bear houses. And they had like four like um, uh, animatronic bears out front that would sing and dance. Right. And I'd sit inside this little house with a two way mirror with a microphone, and I could like make the bears talk and like the mouth would go to whatever I was saying. So like, the little kids would walk by and I'd be like, "Little kid in the green shirt, what are you doing?" And he'd be like, "Holy shit, oh my god, the bear <laughs> talked to me." So, you know, I did this on the conventions. That's why I use the same thing in conventions now. You know, I'm like, oh, little kid that's wearing the Batman costume. His dad's like, he's talking to you. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. using all those skills, man. You know what I mean? And, and you've definitely got I mean, I think you would flourish at conventions. You know, you don't you don't mind talking to people. You know, sure. it's, it's it's harder for people who are, who are much more, um, you know, shy. You know what I mean? The, well, the conventions. Be, well, be, I mean, to be honest with you, you know what I'm saying? Like, to be honest, like, I would. I believe I would flourish because I say it like this, shoot. Shit. Sure. You gotta get in their pockets, don't you? Right. Gotta sell it. Well, there. Gotta- but that's the thing is, I mean that you know, some people are like, you know, reticent to tell people like come and buy my book, but it's just like they're there at the convention. They've already paid. Right. You know, they're there to buy your stuff. You know, you don't don't feel you know, don't feel like you're ripping someone off or bad about it. You know, they're they're happy to buy your stuff. They wanna buy your stuff. That's why they're there. You know, they wanna find new stuff or create, you know, crazy new stuff or you know, whatever, you know? And, you know, to be honest, too, I, I, I feel like uh, some people get tired of seeing the same old stuff there every year. So they go past the, uh, the, the some people and they see other stuff that they haven't seen before. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people that have been to conventions, they see the same thing. Like, you mm-hmm. know, those those uh, conventions, oh, yeah. those heavy goers, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they, yeah. Go to the conventions and they see them constantly. It's like going to the um, like going to the mall. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, I know. Yeah. No, it definitely becomes that for you know for. I guess for people who do do it a lot of times. I mean, that's why it's one of the things that it's you know as a creator for me, I try to keep doing new stuff for that reason. You know what I mean? So like, if someone came to my booth last year, I want to have two new things for them this year for them to see. You know, mm-hmm. give them a give them a reason why they want to come by, you know, come back and see my booth, you know? So you're absolutely right about that. You're absolutely right. 
Right, because uh, I I think I just think it's outside the box when it comes to people like they probably not probably seeing the same old thing, you know. It's like okay, for example, okay, uh, some people probably go past the booths because they're not interested or yeah, or one. Mm -hmm. It's weird, you know. It's like a. Comic conventions have a weird dynamic depending on where you're at and what kind of the size of the convention is. Because you get the fans, you know, when you go to small shows, the fans are definitely there to see, you know, especially small indie shows, the fans are there to find new stuff. You know what I mean? They're, mm -hmm. and they're anxious to come up and say new stuff. I mean, that's the great thing about, you know, that's like um, uh, the great thing about a lot of these things that, you know, you get these aunties and grannies that are coming up to you with their, you know, their kids and grandkids and nephews and nieces. And one of the things they're always amazed about is that there's these other black comics that they've never heard of, you know, like, you know, like my comics or whoever, Robert Roach or whoever it may be, um, they're, they're blown away by that because all they've ever heard of is the mainstream stuff like Black Panther or maybe Falcon, you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe John Stewart, Green Lantern, maybe they know him from the Justice League, but they don't know that there's this whole, you know, this whole galaxy, a whole universe of other, you know, characters out there that look like them, you know? And so when you get these conventions, you get the kids coming up, you know, that are, especially minority kids that are just so thrilled to see characters that look like them or or made by people that look like them. You know what I mean? Um, so it, 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 it makes a difference in those small shows. Now, bigger shows, people aren't quite as there just to find new stuff, like you were saying, you know, they, 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 um, they, uh, they, they kind of walk by sometimes, you know, um, depending on what you got. Um, and like, like I said, unless you have something you're offering them again, so like you said people tend to do that. But you know, small shows people definitely stop and see everything. You know, you may, like you know, you may have a show of you know, say you got sixty thousand people at a show, maybe I don't know, a thousand people come by your booth, you know, or stop by your table, and you know, a hundred of those buy or whatever. You know, you, you know, you think that's all right, but then you may have a small show that has only two thousand people come, but two thousand people come by your booth and five hundred buy. You know, so yeah, that's you know, a, that's. You know what I mean? That's so, money. Yeah. yeah that's, and, money and that's what it comes down to. You know what I mean? I mean, it's prestigious. Look, if you're at San Diego Con or you're at New York Con and you're doing these things, it's really cool, you know, because you're like at the pinnacle of the of the comic book world. You know, it's it's a great thing to do. It's, it's an ego. It's a gratifying thing for ego. You know, it's cool like that. Right. But if you want to make money, you got to do like small shows and niche shows and shows that people don't think about and find ways to get your book in the like, stores and find ways to get your book in people's hands that no one heard of. I mean, you know, I've talked about it for a long time, and it was the reason we formed our distribution company, which is had to shudder because we just couldn't make enough money out of it. But, um, you know, I've tried to figure out ways to get these comics, like, into these people's hands that come to conventions that normally don't know anything about comic books. You know what I mean? Like, how do we do that? You know, how do you how do you get those comics into, like, say, like, you know, some woman living in Memphis, you know, some granny or auntie living in Memphis and got her, got her nieces and nephews that like comic books. How do we get her to know about our stuff, you know? That's that's you know, that's what I'm trying to figure out now. See, how how I would do how I would do it if they went past my table. You know what I would do? <laughs> you know what? I'll go chase them. <laughs> I'll go chase them. I'll go chase them and say, you know, because see me, I do this at my job. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to be able to sell. You have to be able mm, to sell. Yeah, yeah. Like, and this is how this is my technique. This is how I learn. Um. A firm handshake, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Small talk. Mm -hmm. You have to small talk, be able to talk to people and be able to go out. You got it. Some most of, and I and I know when it comes to these when it comes to these shows, you have to be able to talk. You have yeah. to be, show some some show some enthusiast, enthusiasm. Yeah. Well, you know you're, selling yourself, you're selling yourself as much as you're selling your book, you know. Exactly, because people see that. People see your your confidence and see who you see you first before they see your book and it's like a it's like a movie star right, right. they see they see your confidence in how you act and they see you being able to say the words and tell a story with your words you know and depending on how you acting and how you're moving and talking depending on people buying that movie oh yeah 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 oh no no i mean that yeah i mean look the whole arts i mean especially with the you know with the internet and everything the whole arts is you know it used to be a time where you could be a writer and you could be some guy you know doesn't like people or whatever and you can live in a cabin in friggin you know montana 
and you write your novels and everyone reads them and everything, you know, and that's great. But now you got to be out there. You know what I mean? You yeah. got to put yourself yeah. out there. You can't, you can't just hide in your basement and be like, oh, no, I, I you know, I write this story, but I, I can't promote it. I can't sell it. You know, I'm not good at selling or whatever. I mean, the thing is, look, I'm not a good salesman in the sense that I can't sell something I don't believe in. So, like, you know, in college, I sold Cutco knives, like I'm sure a lot of other people do, too. It's a fucking, it's mm -hmm. a racket. They get young people to do. I couldn't sell those things. I don't give a shit about knives. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. when I worked at that bong store on Melrose in the late, in the late 90s, you know, I, I could sell those because I, I believed in the product. You know, I believe that, you know, the people would be better off getting the more expensive things. So I could sell those. And it's much like with my comic book. You know, it's like I believe in my comic. I believe in all my stories. I stand behind every story in my comic. You know, everything that's in there is, you know, I, I believe in. So, you know, it's easy to sell that. You know, it's just selling, like, right. like I said earlier, you're selling for yourself. You're selling yourself. So it's easy right. to sell those kind of things. So the, if, if you're not, you know, I understand, like, people not, you know, not wanting to go, you know, be, they're not the kind of person that can sell stuff they don't think, right? But if right. you believe in your own product and you're at a convention, you got to sell your own stuff. You got to exactly. be aggressive. You got to be aggressive. Because you can't just like, you can't just let people walk by and like you said, you can't just not call them out and be like, "Hey, look at this! You know, look at this! Right. I really like this." You know? Right, and see, see when you're doing your book too, when you see, and that's that's what I learned too. You know, you have to have an eye for what you're doing. Meaning, make the covers of your comic books. I pull, pull, make the shit, make that that cover pull people in. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, well, that's. I mean, that's it. You know, it's it's. You know, it's like the old adage, right? Don't judge a book by its cover, but it does make a difference. That's how you look at. That's how you find books. You know what I mean? That's right. what you see. Oh, you know? it's like even like novels. You know what I mean? Like a good cover mm -hmm. on a novel. It could be if it's a brown cover back, and then there's another novel with a dragon and a, a warrior fighting on it. You're like, oh shit. You know, I like that better than that brown cover back. Could be the same exact book. You know. Mm -hmm. so, and see, I mean, and that's yeah. that's why it's like. You know, no matter how many variants you put up there, no matter how many, you know, colors or gold covers you put up there, right. if it's not pulling the people in, if it's not catching the eye of the people, you're not going to buy, you're not going to sell it. You know what I mean? Well, and like see, this early, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, like you said earlier about how uh, people have seen the same story, you know, if, if, right. if, if you know, telling the same story over and over. And that's the whole thing. I mean, that's, you know, it goes back to a lot of things I, I, I try to teach people when I talk to classes is that you don't have to tell a story no one's seen before. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can tell a very simple story. You just need to learn to tell it well and tell it with your own point of view. So if you tell a story about, girl, you know, guy meets girl, guy loses girl, guy gets girl, right? That's the story. That's, that's the story. The plot can be anything. It can be, you know, the Titanic. It can be a Western, it can be science fiction, it can be drama, it can be horror, but the basic story is this guy meeting a girl, losing a girl, getting the girl. You know what I mean? So you don't have to tell us a story that no one's ever seen before. You just need to tell us your story well. You know, you, you, it's like, mm -hmm. a, it's one of the things I had a problem with when I was like coming out of film school. I thought that I had to like be the best cinematographer and, and shoot things and light things in a way that's no one ever seen before and do all this experimental stuff and that. But no, sometimes the story and just you just need flat lighting with a you know a, 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 a 25 millimeter lens and you just sit there and watch this the action go by within the proscenium arch. You know that works sometimes. You know you don't have to do everything. It's like it's like a lot of things. Like I hear it with a lot of music. A lot of like people get mute. You know, the produce young producers especially. Get a, it's like a, they're making a candy box, you know, like a, a sandbox. You know, they get every little thing. And they want to add every little thing to their to this song. And it's like some songs don't need all that. You know, some some things only need one little beat. You know, they don't need a, a 50 other effects on it. But because they have the ability to do it, people overuse it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, man. It's just, it's like, and that's why when it comes to, you can have a good you can have a good, uh, okay, okay. You can have all the great art you want, right? All the great art you want, right? But if that story is trash and it's not adding up, that no, book look, ain't man, gonna sell, you know? Look, 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 you, you see the perfect example of that. Look, you, go, you go back 30 years to when Image came about, right? Image came about and all those guys were great artists. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Those books were beautiful. I mean, I love getting those early Image books. They were beautiful. But the stories are shit. 
you know, because they didn't bring any writers with them. So it was like these just gorgeous books with like all these caption boxes explaining what's going on instead of just telling a story. But it's, you know, everyone has their strengths. There's some artists that are really good storytellers on their own. Some artists really need a strong writer and editor to, you know, make the story work the way they want it to work, you know? That's it, why, it, that's why to be honest to a lot of guys, and I'm going to tell you the truth, a lot of guys in this industry, the reason why a lot of guys are making it so big and so great and getting these Hollywood deals and these HBO deals and Netflix deals is because of what? They already came in with a name. They already came in with a following. You see what I'm right. saying? Right. And they're going off to. of their following. And that's why right. I say, that's why, to be honest with you, I say they don't really have to work hard to get to for that. They don't well, even have to work thing, hard. They've worked, but see, they've already worked to build that audience. You know what I mean beforehand? I mean, like mm -hmm. I've been in these meetings. I've been in meetings in Hollywood where someone asks, not not using the older executive, but a younger executive will ask, you know, how many followers do you have on Twitter? You know, or how many followers do you have on Instagram? You know, they actually will will check that stuff. And and no, but I'll tell you one thing. Here's one thing I will say about you know, no matter how like it goes back to a lot of things I talk about about you know getting success within the within an entertainment industry about the different factors you need. And, and one of the factors I talk about all the time is relationships and building relationships with people and not burning bridges and not, you know, doing and not doing these things, you know, trying to always be that way. Now, my perfect example of that is I have a contact over at Universal who, uh, he's not a friend of mine by any means, but he's helped me out and get, you know, got me in the meetings or whatever. But I did my Kickstarter when it started, he pledged. Now, I, I had no idea this guy was even following me. You know what I mean? So, cause he never said he was gonna follow me or whatever, but. He obviously is still paying attention because I've built a relationship with him and he and he, you know, he's learned to respect it. So, you know, a lot of a lot of that is, you know, is building those relationships and, and nurturing them. You know, no one's going to know, you know. You can't make it on your own. You know, right. You've got to you've got, you've got to have. Look, look, OK, let me go back. You, you know, you need perseverance, right? You got to keep mm -hmm. doing it. You know what I mean? You can't give up because if you give up. What? You know, you're not going to do anything then. You're just going to work as whatever you've been doing as your day job. You know, that's and that's fine. You know, if that's what you want to do. But the thing is, if you really want to make it, you got to have perseverance. and You can't quit. I mean, dude, I've been trying to do this for 20 some years. And I'm still working. I'm struggling as much as anybody else. You know what I mean? It's just that mm -hmm. I've met a lot of people and I know I know how to talk to people. And then like you got to have the relationships, like I was saying before. I harp on these things all the time. But, you know, relationships got to have before. Then when you have those things, you got to have some luck. You know what I mean? Like an opportunity. <laughs> luck. You know, yeah. because you really do. I mean, that's, you know, you can be the most talented person in the world. I look at some of these people I know that, you know, are just so talented and they never get the opportunity to show that ability, you know. And then after you got all of that, you have to have the talent. You know what I mean? You can't just be some hack, you know. Because then you'll get exposed. And see, and see, that's the thing, too. You know, I see it as a lot of these guys in the industry, right? We tend to go off on another person's success, right? And try to copy off their shit. Right. With the and I, I, to be honest with you, these big guys in this industry, you know, what I'm saying most of them, and I'm gonna tell you like this, most of them came from other other industries. Like, well, uh, yeah, most of them came from other industries. Well, you know, the, the, the the big two have been chasing the hot new thing. And they're looking outside of the comic book industry constantly for it, like you're saying. You know, it's like you get people coming from you get people coming from Hollywood, you get people coming from authors, and I mean, then some of them are good writers, not not to knock them. You know what I mean? I'm not knocking their their game or whatever. They may be a good writer, but they like you said, they've come from somewhere else where they've already been established themselves. Exactly, as, and, and that's yeah. and that's why it makes it harder for guys like oh, without yeah. a voice, without a voice, without a a way to, to without a a book that people don't know about. It makes it harder on them because you're being told, oh, well, you should do it the way uh, Ethan Man right. did, or you should do it right. the way this guy did or Image right. did. Well, it makes it harder on them. It don't make it harder on me because, to be honest with you, I don't want to do it the way nobody did. I'm going to do it the way right. I well, thought it. Exactly. You know? I mean, it, but that's, 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 I think that's what a lot of people miss out on. Is that that's the only way you can do it, right? So now, if you use someone as an example or someone to follow, you know that you know like a mentor or whatever that can help you along, that's fine and that's great. But only you can do it, you know. 
Only yeah. you can tell that story. It's like I tell people all the time. It's like you look if you get in a meeting with Hollywood, you know, the, uh, you know, I'm just using it as a generic term, Hollywood. But you get in a meeting with the executives or whatever. You've got to convince them that you're the only person that can tell that story that you're that you're pitching to them. You know what I mean? That's as much as mm-hmm. the story. It's as much as important to the story as letting them know that you know, like for me, like I grew up, you know, in elementary school in a in a heavily Mennonite area. You know what I mean? So there were like, you know, people running around little bonnets and helmet and the suspenders and that kind of stuff, you know, so I can tell a story from that point of view, being, you know, a minority kid in that kind of situation. And, and it'd be the only, and I was the only one that can tell that story, much like you can only tell your story, you know, the only way you can tell right. your story. And if you, put, if you put your story into, in a jarhead, into a jarhead comic, that's just, re- you know, a reflection of something that you learn, only you can tell that tale. You know, right. it's like if you, if you hire me to write your, your book, it's I'm going to write something that I can relate to, you know, you know, obviously being in your universe. But you know what I mean? It'll be something that comes from me instead of just, you know, coming from your head. You know, right. And that's why, to be honest, too, you know, you rather get somebody that. Similar that no similar to what, you know, because if you get somebody that that's, that's that has a totally different mindset. They're going to fuck up your story. They're going right, to fuck well, it up. Cause... Well, I mean, you know, it, one of my strengths, and I, you know, I don't, I don't like, the, I don't fucking, I'm not, I don't want to pat myself on the back <laughs> too much, but one of my strengths that I've learned in the comic book world is finding the right artist for the right story. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's the main thing. Like, you know, my guy, Christian Alaminos, who does Bovine League, he's just the fucking bomb of an art, just a badass artist, you know, but he wouldn't be good on Hollywood Offenders. His, his, his art just wouldn't. It's too clean. It's too. It's too nice. You know, Hollywood Offenders exactly. is a gritty, grimy story, and it called for a gritty, grimy artist and someone that can understand what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about. So, like our artist for Hollywood Offenders, Alan St. Clark, understood it immediately. And like you know, you can see on the images you attached, he got exactly what we're talking about. The the you know the feelings. Where some other artists, you know, and and look, I use artists from all, from all over the world. I'm not one of these guys that say you know you know don't use art. Don't you only use certain artists. I use artists from all over the world. Or like I said, the best artists for the project. But like. Christian, that guy I was talking about from Bovine League, is out of Argentina. He has no idea about what Hollywood's like. You know what I mean? Right. He has no clue. And I, he, much as so I can explain it to him, much as so I can show it to him, he hasn't. But Alan's been there, so he understands. You know. Right. So, and see, and see, this is the thing: when doing Jarhead, doing Jarhead's um, writing, I wrote it for to to be a gritty, kick-ass, you know, bloody gory dark um scene right but see at first i had the artist you know because i took a while to get my artist you know what i'm saying i took a whole while to get it because Mm -hmm. i didn't want to just put somebody in charge of the art that didn't know my my universe i didn't know my 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 style of writing you know what i'm saying like (laughs) Um, like, uh, I went through, I want to say two artists for Jarhead, two artists, because one of the artists, um, at the time was, he basically, he kept losing, kept, uh, his shit kept breaking at the time. And I'm like, oh my God, you know what I mean? So I just had, and he he took like year, he took a while to to get done stuff. And so what I had to do was I had to go back and forth. I had to go get a, uh, another artist at a short span. Mm-hmm. Short span. You get what I'm saying? So I had to finish that. I put a deadline on myself, you know what I'm saying? And I had to finish it. So that's well, why, you know, go ahead. Wait, did you see that thing that Rob Liefeld or Liefeld, I forgot how you his name, that said about young artists? Did you see that that quote that was going around the internet? Like there was controversy because he was saying that uh, young artists aren't motivated, don't don't work as hard and don't finish projects as you know on time and you know, that kind of thing. And like, I mean, he's right to an extent, so I'm not going to knock him. I mean, I know a lot of people that just think they, they couldn't work on a, a book and finish it in 30 days. They couldn't do a every month book. You know, just And it's no, no knock to them. Maybe the art is so detailed, it's hard to do. You know what I mean? Um, you know, but I personally have noticed younger artists not being able to finish on time when I, when I, when they give their own self a deadline, you know, and I don't know if that's just their youth or that's just the, you know, because like I said, the artwork may be so detailed, it's hard to finish that kind of stuff. You know, because mm-hmm. you look at those old books and, you know, 
people have books like you know old people love like from the 60s and 70s that artwork is some of that artwork is so simple you know and in panels compared to today where they you know people are drawing individual buttons on shirts and wrinkles and you know, everything else you know what i mean see the stuff back then like the 70s and in, in 90 in the 70s and 50s and all that stuff see they didn't have the technology that we have today right. and right. and they and the, their minds was more simpler right you yeah. know what i'm saying and basically they didn't really know detail like we do so well they, it wasn't well you know they they like well you know there are artists that were detailed like that but they just couldn't finish you know they you don't you see their artwork once in a while in a book you're like well why can't that guy do that every month well because their artwork's too detailed or too you know too too expressive too you know what i mean like you, I don't want, I'm not going to start knocking artists because I don't want to sit there and start naming artists. But there are certain artists that – okay, I mean he's dead now. So George Perez, he could draw like 50 characters in a panel. You know what I mean? That guy mm -hmm. was such a prolific artist you know, and so, and so good about it. And he could do it on time. You know, his books – I mean I'm not saying all his books were on time, but he did – you know, his books were constant. He was constantly, you know, month after month after month pumping out teen, new Teen Titans with, you know, an intricate artwork or whatever. So there are people that can do it. You know, right, and then right, you get, right. but then you get someone else who, you know, I don't know. I, you know, like I said, I want to knock it. I don't want to name any names, but there's some people that, you know, take forever to do stuff and you see the work and you're like, well, I don't understand why that took so long, especially if they're getting paid what they're getting paid, you know? Yeah. And see, and see, that's the thing, you know, a lot of the artists today, they rush through it because they want the money so fast, you know, and dealing with people um overseas you know there's a there's a language barrier there oh yeah see what i'm no, saying yeah, if you, yeah, don't... you know you have to you have to know look i worked when i first started doing my book back in the late 90s that's when i first started finding artists you know so it was really hard to find artists back then and i found an overseas artist and he was really talented but i had to like you know walk him hand you know hand by hand on everything i needed because he didn't understand you know he couldn't make the translation the way i wanted him to make the translation you know well see and that's the thing too you know you know you being a um a hollywood director bro i know i i know how you feel man because i dealt with that with my first jarhead with jarhead you know he my uh first artist was was in brazil right and you know we barely you know talked and everything which was Leo Gundam, Leo C Gundam. Leo is my nigga. He, he's real cool. He's real cool, Yo. real cool. Um, Leo is very, um, he's very intricate. And he, he takes right. time on stuff. You know what I'm saying? And me and him, we built that relationship over time. There you know you what I'm saying? There you go. And, this, and the thing about, about it is, is that Leo loved working with me um, because I never rushed them or anything. Right. The reason why I, some things, if like working with me, is I'm very hands on and I'm an artist myself. So mm -hmm. if I'm like just bugging you, talking to you every five minutes or every five seconds, it's because basically I'm an artist and I'm getting ideas over and over and over and over and it's popping out of my head constantly. And it's just, it's just like, I don't mean to bug that person, but it's like, you know, so it's it's something sometimes it, you know it gets overwhelming. That yeah. was when I was younger, young in the business at the time, where I kind of like pushed my artists away. And I'm talking about my flaws. I ain't, I ain't, I'm I, I can expose myself. I'm transparent yeah. like that. You know what I'm saying? And at the time, you know, I wasn't as patient as I am now, because like me at the time, I was seeing things from a from a person looking out, looking in, instead of a person being hands on like I was, you know, mm -hmm. and me being the person that I was, that I am, like I started to see and feel things differently, you know what I'm saying? Right. And with that being said, like I, 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 um, I've built my relationships with those guys that I that I had that, that finished the book of right. Jarhead. And we get along real great, and I think it it, it works great. It works it works fine because you got to build that relationship with right. the people who you who you doing your books with you because you yeah, don't. Yeah, no, you got to. Yeah, you got to, man. And speaking of Jarhead, 
you can go to the Kickstarter for Hollywood Offenders. You can get a PDF of Jarhead when you when you sign up there. So damn man, do that. Do that. There do you that. go. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, too, you know, um, when it comes to you know uh, Hollywood Offenders, right? How many years have have this been in your mind to do? So in my mind, well, th this particular story in my mind hadn't been in my mind that long at all. I mean, like I said, David and I were living together during the pandemic, um, where, you know, so we were coming up with different ideas and we, you know, have a bunch of different things. We bounced off each other. But this one idea called, you know, we just had this crazy idea about Hollywood Boulevard. We just kept talking about it. And then we, um, and then, um, you know, when we, when I was like, well, let's use this name Offenders for it. Like, we'll call it the Hollywood Offenders. This, if this, it became about organically of us sitting around and just, you know, talking shit. And thinking of you know dumb ideas and stuff that we thought would really work well that were kind of silly but yet you know we can put a little more we can put you know some profound stuff behind it you know what i mean but nonetheless it's it's really it was really you know it, it didn't take that long to come up with the idea honestly it was it, it came up quickly within two years we had the from the beginning of talking about it to the final script to getting the artwork done it's been about two years you know so it, it wasn't a long time it wasn't like you know like the bovine league I thought about that thing for years before I did anything. And that came about because I bought a coffee mug in Switzerland when I was on vacation. So, and on coffee mug, it had like little carrot, little cows on the coffee mug. And each cow represented in a different state within Switzerland or Canton rather within Switzerland. And, uh, you know, that's basically where the, where the whole thing came from. So I thought about that for a long time, but, you know, Hollywood Defenders really came quickly. And then when we started going back and forth, the ideas were just bouncing stuff off each other. And then once we found Alan as the artist, he did some sample artwork for us, and that helped even more because then we're like, oh, that, that's great. This artist, that guy looks like this, and we can tell the story that way, you know. So it came about really quickly once we once we had the the you know finished idea. Awesome, awesome. I right, so see. I always have those stories like that too, man. Because like with that stuff, it always comes out quick, 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 quick. Right, right. And you're always like, your mind is like you know, running, right. trying to get it all down, get it all down. Right, yeah, but yeah. That's what happens when it came to the collision of the Colossus because that came so quick and it was like, okay, before you come out with book two, make a such and such, make that and make that into like a, a action that, book. That was so fun to write, man. That was because it was all the, all the, you know, the splash, it was all splash pages and you know, it was that, you know, it was like all I did to write was some gritty, you know, grimy stuff, a lot of blood and gore. And, it, you know, I, I really had a fun writing that. Let me ask you something. Did it did it have to did it did it take you out of your element or did it just. Well, I mean, a little out of my element, which is fine. You know, it's just like I, I just don't I don't usually write stuff that that uh that gritty, you know, for instance. I mean, you know, that that uh that real, you know, real violent that well. But it's fine. You know, it's like, you know, if you don't use those if you don't use those muscles, if you don't exercise those kind of muscles, you'll lose them. And I don't want to be able to lose that. You know, I want to be able to write any in any environment, you know, for sitcom or drama or whatever I want to, you know, get an opportunity to write in. So you don't want to lose those chops, you know. I mean, shit, man, me and a writing partner of mine were writing a Hallmark script, except, you know, one of those Christmas movies, except we kept mm -hmm. making it too smart. You know, it's like, it's like, yeah. you write it and be like, what? That, that's too, that's, that's, there's too much, you know, they don't do that in those movies, you know. It's like, exactly right, so, right, right. You know? So, but it's the one of those, you know, I encourage people to write different things, you know, just, you know, I write comics, I write scripts, I write, I don't, I'm not great at writing songs or poetry, but I do some of that stuff, you know, like you said, I have a journal where I write, you know, I have a notebook where I write everything in, you know, any idea that comes up, I try to bang it down and have it in there and then use it for something else. You know what I mean? Like, like an idea that I may have had for Sisters of Power is like, well, that really doesn't work for sisters, but it really works for the bovine league, you know? So, you know, it's, it's having all that, having all your ideas, that, you know, down is a good thing. You know, you know what's crazy? Like when it came to a collision of classes, I didn't have no uh no synopsis for that. Right. I didn't. I was just like, I just gave you the idea yeah. of what it was. I didn't so have no. No, that yeah, was, that was I, so fun about it. It was you know it was totally. I did one. I I I I I had read your original Jarhead, so I was familiar with the character, or at least one of the characters. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I knew what his motivations would be going into the into the fight. I just had to go with Smash X's motivations, you know, and figure out if the reasons for him to do that. You know, no, it it was fun, man. You know, I'll, you know, I'd gladly write another story in your universe. You know, it was a lot of fun to do that. Yeah, cause and you know, it's crazy. I what I want to do, right? I want to collaborate with with folks, 
but I don't want to go to the point to where, like, because I want to start uh, writing, um, what do you call those things? Um, movie scripts hmm. for uh, for the series of Jarhead. Because what I want to do is, um, is like, the, the movie script that I want to do for Jarhead is... It's going to be totally, it's going to be in line with the actual book. It's going to be very in line with the book, but it's going to add more on to it. And it's going to, right. it's going to get this, the movies, the series is going to give you more of what the book couldn't give you. Right. See what I'm saying? Well, I'll give you some advice and, about writing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I'll give you some advice about writing screenplays. Or, I mean, I guess it can be, this, can, this, this advice can go to, to, to any writing. But in particular, writing screenplays, because I'm familiar with that, you know, is to do it is you have number one, you have to begin with the end in mind. You know what I mean? You, mm -hmm. you need to you have to have the end. I mean, you don't have, to have the whole idea of exactly how it ends, but you got to have an idea of where you want to go. So you want to begin it with the ending in mind. You it, number two thing, never throw away an idea, never ever, mm -hmm. never throw away an idea, never ever ever. No matter how stupid and small it is, no matter how small it is, if it's an idea you came up with, it's your idea. Don't throw it away. You know what I mean? And one of the main thing I think people don't understand is to make a story great, it's got to have kind of a bittersweet ending for the hero. Um, like you know, you take like Indiana Jones. Now Indy gets what he wants, right? He finds the gra he finds the Grail, and you know he gets the the the, not, the acknowledgement that he wanted from the beginning. But what happens with the Grail? He gets put into a a box and throw you know thrown with a million other boxes, so it becomes nothing. So it's bittersweet in the sense that he got what he wanted, but he's still lost, you know. Um, right. And then the other thing, uh, you know, not to be too much scholar teacher here, but the other thing about um, characters when you're writing a story is that usually, usually this isn't this isn't 100 percent of the time. So, you know, not, but usually they end in one or two things. They either end in gaining confidence. Right. They, the character gains confidence, learns who he is or they learn to care about something. You know, it's like for my comic, my comic um, Omega Chronicles, uh, the long graphic I've been working on that it's the number two. The character has to learn to care. He has to learn that he needs people to help him succeed. He can't just do it on his own, you know. So yeah, so that's some simple things I tell you about about screenwriting is to do that. And then we could talk again. I got a, I got this whole uh, document I could send to you that could, that'll help you about you know uh, like plotting things out and writing outline and stuff. Yeah, because uh, I because I wanted to I wanted to ask you like how much how much do like apart from doing like big movies, right? How much do it cost doing like series and stuff like that? Uh, it's still expensive as hell, man. I mean, you know, anything that <laughs> no, it's no, it's expensive. No, I mean, you you know, I mean, unless you unless you're just independently wealthy or or you know, it's hard. I mean, no, look, look, it's two things. You know, if you want to make if 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 you want to just do a project, you've got your heart set on doing it. You, it's easy to do nowadays compared to when I was coming up. You know, I mean, you can mm -hmm. you can hell you can take your friggin' cell phone. And shoot a friggin' film on it. You know what I mean? You can do the whole friggin' thing right there. It's you know, edit it on yourself, and you can do it all self-contained. So there's a way to get your set up there really cheap. But okay, it goes back in once again. It goes back to another thing. Um, the production triangle, right? So you have this production triangle. You have three sides to it. You can have you have good, fast, and cheap, right? So you can have good, mm -hmm. fast, and cheap. You're only allowed two of those things at a time, though. So it can good and cheap, but it won't be fast. It can be fast and good, but it won't be cheap. You know what I mean? It can be mm -hmm. cheap and fast, but it won't be good. So you're only allowed two of those three things within the production triangle. So you have to think that in mind when you're doing any project, you know. So like you were saying earlier, some of your artists you don't pressure because you know they're doing great art and it's going to take them time. So you're doing it, you know, I imagine doing it slow and cheap, which means it'll be good, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a set in stone thing by any means, but it's something you have to think about when you're, you know, trying to do a production. Well, yeah, because like – um yeah, because, like, man, that's why I said it. this is something that I really want to do. Like, because right. I feel like, you know, just doing a book, doing a book, it's it's, okay, it's fine, but I think it's, I, I need to give the – I want to give the people more. I want to show them what's really in my head when it comes to Jarhead, what's really going on when it comes to Jarhead. What's what's jar what's in the mind? What's in the, the spirit? Because I'm telling you, book two is not gonna be able to carry like this whole series is not gonna be able to carry what's really what I really wanna say 
when it comes to a book. That's why I said like a movie, like a mini series. I'm telling you that I could say all kinds of shit and everything. I could do all kinds of stuff when it comes to the mini series. I mean, because um, when it comes to Jarhead, like man, like when it comes to Jarhead, dog, like I think, and I, and this is what I feel. Like I want to come out. I'm gonna come out with a with a, a trailer first, and then you know see what everybody likes, and then come out with this mini series because I don't well, want to. Dude, I mean, if you can do it, look, if you can get the financing to do it, I I totally encourage you to do it. You know, I I'm someone that, that thinks that you know that if you can do these small independent productions, you can get them done. I mean, there's there's you know there, there's tons of places to get them shown now. You know what I mean? This is, I mean, uh, no, we're talking, uh, you know, it's still going to cost you money. It's not going to, you can't do it for a thousand dollars, you know, it's going to, you know, but you don't have to spend $10 million either. You know what I mean? You, right, you, right. And so, you know, but, but once again, you know, it's what, you know, what you have to do at this point is start to build relationships with people that you're going to, you know, going to need to help you to make these projects, you know? You well, know, yeah, like, yeah. Um, you know, I've, you know, editors and, you know, finding people that you can, you know, start talking to because like, I know a lot of people like, um, I've seen friends that's done Kickstarters and people just to work on their film will actually pay them to do do work on their film. You know, they're like, oh, well, I really believe in that. So I really want to be an editor on that. I'll give them, you know, $500 in their Kickstarter if I get to edit. And that way you're not even paying them. They're literally paying you to do the work. And I've seen that happen over and over because people are excited to work with someone because they want to work with someone. You know, which right, once again, right. what's that? It's relationships, you know? So. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I said, man, like, I want to have many things under my belt. You know what I'm saying? Many things under my belt and many things. Uh, I want to have many guns. Well, the thing, is, because... the thing is, you're young, right? So you've got the opportunity to throw a bunch of stuff out there and see which direction you want to go. You know what I mean? At, 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 at my age, I've already, I've got a pretty much, you know, idea of where I'm going with lane I'm in. But, you know, you, you still got an opportunity to be like, well, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think you would do it, but I mean, you may end up writing romantic comedies, you know. So, you know what I, mean? <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't know, you know. What I'm saying, I was I would... your target, my ideas maybe about him meeting some woman, you know, or you know, <laughs> you know, at a Christmas party. You know what I mean? I don't know, you know. But I mean, I mean, let's just say it like this, you know. I already, I'm gonna say it like this. I already know who I want to play. Jarhead. It's either out of a. Uh, I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it the same, out of out of Braun Strowman from WWE, or um, the Mountain from um, from Game of Thrones. Wow! So big. You seem that big. Yeah, yeah. Jarhead is seven, six foot seven, right. right? Six foot seven, almost six foot nine. One, one of them, and he's three hundred and forty pounds. Right. Pure muscle, Pure muscle. monster. Yeah, so, muscle. yeah, I know cameras could do could. Uh, manipulate that all that stuff, but I want something well, you, that's real. Well, you can't, you can't, you can't fake um size. I mean, you can fake height in film, and you can fake a lot of things. You know, like like you know, for instance, like in um Thor: Love and Thunder, and we can get we can go after this. I know you probably time. Yeah, we've been on it for an hour, so I go. Um, but like in Thor: Love and Thunder, one of the one that the things are to make uh, Natalie Portman look big is she'd stand stand on what they call an apple box. You know, it's just a box, so she it'll, mm -hmm. you know give her you know six inches or seven inches of height. So, so she can be in the frame with, you know, with uh, Chris Hemsworth, you know, um, they do, you know, there's all kinds of tricks like that. You know what I mean? I mean, look, man, if you, back in the old days, they made like Westerns to make these little short stars that, you know, guys are like five, seven, five, eight, they would make doors smaller. So they would look taller in the door frame. You know what I mean? So oh, like, wow. Yeah. So you'd be like, well, that dude must be, you know, six, seven. He's so tall in the door frame, but no, he's five, six. <laughs> and they just wow. made the door smaller. Him. So, you know, there's all kind of ways you can do stuff. Is, is that, see, and this is the thing. You can teach, you know, you can teach guys to read. Sorry about that with the camera in my hand. Sorry. You can reach, uh, you can teach people how to act. It is what they put, what they, will they put the, the effort? Well, yeah, well, well, it's just like, you know, it's, and, and well, or do they have the skills? You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you can teach someone to play football, but you can't teach speed. You know what I mean? They innately, mm -hmm. they innately have speed. Like I, I wasn't a great athlete, 
but I, I was fast. Like I ran track, you know, and I was faster than most people. I still couldn't play football, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, it's like it didn't you know it wouldn't work. So I mean, I tell you what, like a lot of the stuff that um that that big of a character, like because I've seen the dude that played Mountain. He is exactly the way Jarhead is. If you really look at him, his size, his his his, his frame is huge, dog. Like he's a body, he's a power lifter. Right. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And um, even not without you know the 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 muscle mass. Even if it's just those guys are so big. You know, you get to be six seven, six eight, seven foot tall. You're a big dude. You know, I mean, like you know. Like, like I met, like I met Magic Johnson one day. The dude, you know, he's like six nine, and he's just wide, you know. He just blocks out the sunlight. Now he's not someone you think about as, you know, the mountain or someone being muscular, but it's just like because they're so big, they're just gigantic, you know, compared to everybody else, you know. Right, right. Um, that's why, that's why when I when I uh saw what I wanted, you know, when I saw Jarhead, I said, man, put put this guy in the in a show with a guy that with the Wolverine or Hawk, I bet you Jarhead to take him out. <laughs> Easy. Because and Jarhead the writer, uh, the writer, they, some some writer would make, you know, you know, Jarhead would beat the shit out of Wolverine, but he would re you know, regenerate and <laughs> Yeah, like <laughs> see, Wolverine. Yeah. that's why I said like, you know, I want to do something where like because I want to do something, do like a, a segment where um, people take their characters, right? A versus character, right? A versus mode, like a segment for the show versus where like two creators come on the show and they battle it out with trash talk. Oh, right. On with their oh, characters. Your, my character is better than your character. My character kicked your character's ass. And, such and, such. and a lot of people are just not confrontational, but it's, it's, but when it comes to my show, it's fun. It's a fun loving type of what's engagement. What's the name of your what's the name of your show? The In Your Face Show. <laughs> yeah, the In Your Face Show. Like that's, that's something. But uh anyway, speaking of in your face, man, I gotta go. We've been talking for a while, but I've I've really gotta go run a bunch of errands. So you know, I always enjoy coming on your show because you just let me sit there and ramble for an hour or two. It's all fun, man. All fun. But yeah, so man, that, look, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I was just gonna do a little self promotion. Go ahead, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. Everybody out there, go to Hero Unlimited. That's H-I-R-O Unlimited.com. That's my website with my company with all my books. Please go and purchase them. I really would appreciate it. And if you're going to support the comic, go to Kickstarter and look up Hollywood Offenders. That's A-F-E-N-D-E-R-S. So Offenders, not Offenders. Anyway, just want to put it out there, man. You know, a little self-promotion. And that's all we have for y'all today, folks. Yo, this is... It's been well, and this is the in your face, your face, in your face, in your face. So, and we out. Bye. Later. Peace.